Um, welcome everyone. My name's Lily. Uh, like I said, I'm an organizer with Amistad Law Project and Free Them to Heal Us. Really excited to have so many people here with us tonight um, to learn about uh, the forces propping up mass incarceration in Pennsylvania and how we can unite together against them. Um, it's my proud pleasure and honor to pass the mic to um, Kempis Ghani Songster to start us off. Ghani, I'm looking for you to unmute. Ooh, there you go. Ah. There we go. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Um, peace, uh, power, and love and light to everyone here tonight. Um, it's not some trite thing to say that it's an honor and a blessing to, to, to join you all as part of a Pennsylvania Justice Alliance event. It really is special. We've just about made it through another year, our second year of living with a pandemic, our umpteenth year fighting for healthier and safer communities, a more humane society, and for our loved ones to come home. Um, full human development for everybody. We're embattled over that, even over fighting for our planet. We've had some wins, freed a number of people this year, freed people who just a year prior, it looked impossible to free through the system's doors anyway. For some of those, it isn't just a miracle that they're free, it's a miracle that they are alive to experience freedom given how they were treated even in old age and terminal physical health by the state. One thing that might be crucial for us to appreciate and never lose sight of though, um, is in the very title of this event, who keeps people in prison, exposing the lobby of mass incarceration in Pennsylvania? A crucial question that begins with a vital word, who, not what, but who? Perhaps one of the practices of our movement that calls for some long overdue self-criticism is the abstractification, if that's a word, of who is fighting against us. That is, we talk about the problem we're facing in abstract terms. We use terms like the state, the system, the courts, institutionalized racism, structural violence, poverty, gentrification, even mass incarceration. Not one concrete human being, or rather flesh and blood human being is identified. And everything we're fighting against, or that's fighting against us, to be, to be more correct, is human beings, people, our struggles are about humans versus humans, people versus people. It's people doing things to other people. No longer should we allow these individuals to hide behind these abstract terms like some wizards of Oz behind a curtain labeled DOC or a curtain we call the state, the system, structural violence or whatever. So it seems we're waking up to this crucial point and perspective in the way we've titled the focus of our gathering here this evening. Again, who, not what, but who keeps people in prison? Who are these other people who have actively and relentlessly fought against eliminating the death penalty in Pennsylvania? Who are these people that call Governor Wolf's death penalty moratorium illegal? Who are these people that have fought against parole for lifers or second chances for people sentenced to death by incarceration. Who are these people who have fought against ending direct file for young people and treating kids as kids who've been accused of serious crimes? Who are these people that's fought against legalizing marijuana, right? And causing people who haven't hurt anybody to not be criminalized? Who are these people that's fought against ending mandatory minimum sentences that fuel mass human caging. Who are these people, right, that's fought against making the law, making it a law that in Pennsylvania that ended juvenile life without parole or child life without parole in accord with Miller versus Alabama, right, that fought to keep me in prison for another five years. Who are these people 
that fights against compensating people who have been exonerated of crimes. Who are these people that fought against closing SCI Pittsburgh and SCI Retreat and probably other prisons as well, right? Who are these people that the baldest, point, baldest report had said, you know, work relentlessly to racially stack the jury, right? To produce or create juries that are prone to convict people of color. Who are these people who constantly fight to expand the police's ability to conduct surveillance? Who are these people that's always working to limit the governor's reprieve program to people only convicted of nonviolent offenses, right? Who, uh, and who might be in a, within a year of release, right? We'll tell you who. It's a group of individuals who have organized themselves into a lobby of mass human caging, right? Human warehousing in Pennsylvania. We'll tell you who. This lobby calls themselves the District Attorneys Association, an association of people driven by greed, racism, classism, careerism, and all the isms that set them apart, above, and in judgment of other people. All the isms that have them thinking that they're untouchable. And so there it is. There's one thing among other things, right, that's vital for us to hold in our hearts and minds and spirits in this conversation tonight. And that there's, there is a who. We see them clearly now through the curtain, right? They are not driven by justice, right? Or humanity and what's good for all people. And their lives are tied to elected seats. They are organized. Yes, they are, but so are we. And we must become even more organized. We have to out-organize them. And that's one of the things we can discuss tonight. We identified them. They can't hide from our site. They are the DA Association. And knowing your opposition is half the battle. Know also that they had a beginning though. In Pennsylvania before 1850, the investigation and prosecution of crime was solely the province of the Attorney General and his deputies. And on May 3rd, 1850, the Pennsylvania legislature passed what was known as an act providing for the election of district attorneys. So no such thing as a DA existed prior to that date in this country. They were not always here. They had a birth date and they can and must and will have an end date. The other half of knowing is knowing ourselves, knowing what we have the capacity to do and be when we wake up together, come together, work together, fight together and win together, right? Knowing who we really are. And in that spirit, I'd like to end with these words, this prayer, this meditation and exhortation that I love to always say from the Terma Collective. It's a prayer of meditation for wartime. And it goes, may our eyes remain open even in the face of tragedy. May we not become disheartened. May we find in the dissolution of our apathy and denial the cup of the broken heart. May we discover the gift of the fire burning in the inner chamber of our being, burning great and bright enough to transform any poison, may we offer the power of our sorrow to service of something greater than ourselves. May our guilt not rise up for yet another defensive wall. May the suffering purify and not paralyze us. May we endure, may sorrow bond us and not separate us. May we realize the greatness of our sorrow and not run from its touch or its flame. May clarity be our ally and wisdom be our support. May our wrath be cleansing, cutting through the confusion of denial and greed. May we not be afraid to see or speak our truth. May the bleakness of the wasteland be dispelled and may the soul's journey be revealed and the true hunger fed. May we be forgiven for what we have forgotten and blessed with the remembrance of who we really are, right? who we really are as the Pennsylvania Justice Alliance, 
and what we can really accomplish together in the fight for a more livable world, which is a world without the Pennsylvania DA's association, as we know it, is a thing that without further ado, I will stop right here so that we can get into. Thanks, Gandhi. Thanks for leaving us with those words and that fire and the inspiration that will carry us through the, the nitty gritty that we're about to get into as we break in the PDAA or yes. Um, so now I'm going to pass it to Chris, the executive director of Amistad Law Project, who's going to keep taking us down this road of, of what is the, the district attorney's association. But first, I'm going to unmute Chris. Yep, there you go. Thank you, Lily. <laughs> Thank you for holding down the, the technical uh, assistance for this event and also for unmuting me. Uh, Thank you, Ghani. It's always good to be grounded in your powerful vision of what our world could be and what our communities need. Uh, there's so much at stake and so much that we can win if we move out together to demand it. Uh, there's a powerful quote that I want to share. Uh, by the late Philly-based activist, John Bell. Uh, I'm reminded of this when I think about what's possible and have a cat in my lap who might make an appearance at some point. Uh, he said, half of your rights haven't been written yet because you haven't been here to demand them. And in that spirit, I wanna say that later tonight, we're gonna be talking about things that we can do to make another world possible, uh, a world that's based in transformative justice and not perpetual punishment. Um, but before we can talk about the actions that we need to take, uh, first we need to understand this problem and we have to expose the forces that are often obscured that shape our world and influence our government. So I'm gonna kick us off by breaking down some analysis of the problem. So what is the problem? Well, the problem is that the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association is a roadblock to criminal justice reform in Pennsylvania. Um, what do I mean by that? It's simple. Most legislators and people in Pennsylvania politics who pay attention to criminal justice reform know that the PDAA, Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association, uh, opposes criminal justice legislation and it is unlikely to move forward. So the common refrain is that uh, the chairs of the Senate and House Judiciary Committee will not list a criminal justice reform, reform bill for a vote uh, if the PDAA opposes it. Um, and then if a bill doesn't get listed in committee, it can't move forward, can't go to the floor, can't get an actual vote. So in this sense, they can stop legislation, uh, such as the second chance for parole eligibility, uh, the bill that later on we're gonna talk some about, um, but that bill would allow people who are serving life without parole uh, to have a chance at parole eligibility. And so many folks on this call and so many others who aren't on here uh, have been working on uh, that bill, working on that campaign, this movement for years. Um, and that's the sort of thing that the PDAA can stop in its tracks. Um, the other thing they can do is actually water down legislation um, that has a lot of support. Um, so things that you know maybe are, are actually going to be able to give us uh, some of what we want, um, they can actually make that way more narrow in scope or limited. Um, so why is that? Well, the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association is the organization that brings together the political power of 66 elected district attorneys in Pennsylvania. Um, it focuses on lobbying legislators for laws that increase the power of the DAs. And at this point, every DA in the state is a part of that association other than Larry Krasner, who's the DA in Philly. Uh, the simple fact is that local, locally elected DAs want more power. Uh, most of the DAs in Pennsylvania want to rack up more convictions and put people away on longer sentences. Uh, they do this because they think that that's how they're going to get political points. And when it comes to election time, they'll be able to show that they're doing their job and being tough on crime. So the PDAA acts as their common space, which also then functions as a lobby. Um, functions as a lobby for their interests and also a trade association where career prosecutors can find resources and exchange knowledge. So it's in this sense that the PDAA is the lobby of mass incarceration. 
Um, they have an executive director named Greg Bro, who functions as their main lobbyist in Harrisburg. Uh, you might be thinking that there are a lot of groups that lobby, a lot of groups spend a lot of time in Harrisburg. So why is the PDAA so powerful? To put it simply, the PDAA is so powerful because it's made up of locally elected officials um, in every county of Pennsylvania except Philly. Uh, legislators listen to them because they're not just a special interest group in Harrisburg. They represent politically powerful people in their districts. Um, so there are three primary reasons why some legislators don't wanna get on the bad side of their local DA. Number one is that local legislators sometimes have constituents come to them about matters dealing with the local prosecutor's office. So this could be, you know, a legislator could favor having a good relationship with the local prosecutor's office so that they can get their constituents questions answered and help them out. So basically constituent services. Uh, maybe a politician can influence the DA to downgrade a prosecution for an important constituent to a lesser charge or maybe a legislator can impress on a local prosecutor uh, that they want the victim's family to have more meetings with the person who's handling that case, the ADA that's on that case. Uh, legislators don't need inroads into the local DA's office, but it can greatly benefit them to have a good working relationship with the local DA. They can get things done for people who matter to them. So number two is that these locally elected DAs have their own political power within their own counties. They've been elected. Um, so they have connections, allies, political influence. Just like any politician, they can exert power behind the scenes. Local DAs can get other powerful people they're allied with in a county to go to a legislator and question why they support a certain bill or position, and they can press on them to do otherwise. So, and then number three, and this is probably the most important thing, um, local DAs have a powerful bully pulpit because the common sense in society is that DAs and judges, in some places also public defenders, um, they're experts on the law. They can have a powerful voice in local media and local community. Some legislators fear getting called out publicly by their DA because they think it could cost them come election time. And local DAs can publicly, can publicly slam legislators for supporting legislation by claiming they don't support victims, they're endangering public safety, or that they're soft on crime. Um, and DAs are really, you know, they're really, uh, they are really powerful and able to do that. Um, so for all these reasons, legislators take the positions of the association, the PDAA, that represents uh, the interests of locally elected DAs, they take it seriously. Um, and that's why they're so powerful in Harrisburg. So there's another reason that they're powerful um, that we've sort of alluded to in different ways. Power often accumulates, whether that's in society or in the workplace or the home. That's because we are unable to name it. Power doesn't like to be named because when it's named, it can be exposed and then it can be criticized and challenged. So that's why there was a time in this country when Black people couldn't openly, openly criticize white supremacy without, you know, pretty much the certainty that the Klan would come after them. That's why there was a time when women couldn't openly criticize patriarchy or not being able to vote. Power wants to stay in power and it does so by refusing to be named. Those in power wanna act as if they're not and they're just expressing the common sense of the entire society. Like the PDAA is not saying, hey, guess what, we're in charge. We can, we can make it so that none of these bills get passed. Um, they, they say that, hey, we're just saying what everyone else is saying. Um, but I want to say today that it makes no sense that we incarcerate thousands of Black, Brown, and working class white people in Pennsylvania. They're going to grow old and die in prison despite having turned around their lives. And I don't want to continue to allow the PDAA to uphold such a cruel and racist system. So the first step to undoing this, healthy, this unhealthy grip that the PDAA has is naming it and also talking about its history, some of the specific things that they've done. Um, in a little bit, we're gonna talk about how we can challenge that power um, and some of that background information. Um, but right now, we're going to hear from Robert Celine Holbrook, who is the executive director of Abolitionist Law Center. He's gonna talk about um, parole for lifers and uh, 
what some of what the PDA has done in the past um, to, to try and get that shut down. Thank you, Chris, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, my name is Robert Salim Holbrook. I'm the executive director of the Abolitionist Law Center and our lobbying C4 arm straight ahead. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my personal experiences over the years um, as someone who served 27 years in prison, someone who went to prison as a juvenile, and someone who watched the rise of mass incarceration, not only in the state, but in this country, but more importantly, saw the role of the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association in that rise. Um, and just to share some, some of the seminal moments of the PA District, Attorney, District Attorneys Association in, in creating the rise of mass incarceration, I wanna share some, some legislation that is primarily responsible for mass incarceration in Pennsylvania and the United States that not, the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association not only supported, but also were actively involved in drafting. Um, so one of those is the 1993 crime bill, um, a crime bill which poured billions of dollars into the states that was signed in 1993 by President Clinton and that was promoted by district attorneys associations, police associations across the country, as well as police unions. Um, in Pennsylvania alone, billions of dollars went into the state to construct new prisons. Shortly thereafter that, Governor Tom Ridge, a former prosecutor and member of the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association, convened a 1995 special session on crime that resulted in 24 new laws being enacted in Pennsylvania, as well as increased mandatory minimum sentencing. Shortly after that, the, the 1995 Prison Litigation Reform Act was passed that impeded prisoners' ability to file lawsuits that challenged their unconditional conditions of confinement. District attorneys associations were involved in drafting and supporting those. And then the 1996 Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act to the long title to defer, deter terrorism, provide justice for victims, provide for an effective death penalty. The Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association as well as national district attorneys associations were actively involved in drafting all of these legis all of these legislations are having input in them nationally as well as locally in Pennsylvania. Um, so that shows you their reach. Um, much closer to home and more recently um, in Pennsylvania, many of us member who are members of the Coalition to Abolish Death by Incarceration who have been fighting for parole for lifers for years went through a experience with the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association in 2018 when our bill that would have provided parole eligibility for lifers was on the verge, on the cusp of being voted out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Now, this would have been the first time in the history of Pennsylvania that a bill providing parole eligibility for lifers, people sentenced to life without parole in Pennsylvania, would have made it to the Senate floor for a vote. Um, and two days before that vote, was to be made by the Judiciary Committee, the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association, in partnership with the Office of Victim Advocate, launched an aggressive campaign against two members of that committee that caused those committee members to withdraw their support um, in the committee for that bill to make it to the floor. And so that bill died, unfortunately, in committee and really set back our our fight for years, for several years here in Pennsylvania. Now, would that bill have been passed if it made the floor? Unlikely. However, the fact that it would have caused debate on the floor and would have built our momentum up and would have put momentum on our side would have had us in a much stronger position today. Um, and our response to that though, right, we recognize that this was a mass incarceration lobby in Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association and the Office of Victim Advocate, the two of them combined constituted a lobby for mass incarceration that had to be confronted and had to be confronted aggressively. So we confronted the Office of Victim Advocate and through that we were able to talk about a narrative, a different narrative of victims, dual victims, victims who have been impacted by not just mass incarceration but also by violence in our communities. 
promoting that narrative and pushing back on the narrative of the Office of Victim Advocate, which only wanted our communities and only wanted society and the media to see one version of victim, which oftentimes was a victim not from communities most impacted by violence or mass incarceration, black and brown communities, but their ideal of a victim was usually a white suburbanite or someone from central Pennsylvania. Um, and we were successful in pushing back on that victim nar narrative that resulted in Jennifer Storr being removed. However, we still have the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association to deal with. Presently, we are fighting once again for parole eligibility for lifers, as well as parole eligibility for geriatric prisoners. We believe that this legislation is legislation that is rooted in public safety because these prisoners that we are advocating for are prisoners that have been in prison at the minimum here of 25 years, right? And many of them have been in prison for close to 50 years. These individuals deserve an opportunity to go before a parole board and show that they are not the people that they were when they were 18, 19, 20 years old. But more importantly, this category of prisoners that we are advocating for, this category, of, excuse me, this category of people that we are advocating for are people who have the lowest recidivism rate of any offender. So what that means is, although they may have been convicted of serious offenses, when these categories of people are released from prison who have served these decades long sentences, they have the lowest recidivism rates of any offender. So this is a public safety. However, even with that, in conversations that we have had with, with legislators like Todd Stevens, who is a former prosecutor himself and who is one of the main mouth, mouthpieces for the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association, told us very, very bluntly that I'm aware of those statistics, but I don't care. For me, it's just about retribution. And even when victims say that I don't share that concern, his position is still, well, it's not about those victims, I have to consider the other victims. And so this event that we're at tonight is to not just educate people about the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association, but more importantly, build a statewide movement and our partners over at Amnestad Law Project are leading this to confront this entity that has been impeding criminal justice reform in Pennsylvania for decades, right? Since their inception, that is what they exist for. They do not exist to empower or help our communities. They do not exist to make our communities safer. And they certainly do not represent the communities, the black and brown communities, even the poor communities that are most impacted by mass incarceration and more importantly, violence and harm. So where we're at today is we are, at, we are continuing to advocate for second chances for lifer and geriatric parole. We have built a strong coalition, a very diverse coalition to advocate for this across the state. But most importantly, we have to build a strong movement that can neutralize or defeat the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association, as well as any other auxiliary or component of the mass incarceration lobby, including the Office of Victims Advocate, the FOP, or anyone who gets in the way of what's in the best interest of our loved ones, as well as our loved ones community. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak um, tonight. And let's build this movement to not only bring our loved ones home, but to empower our communities. Yeah, thanks, Salim. Really appreciate you being here and sharing so much about, about that history and where we've been and, and where we're headed and, and the importance of, of navigating the obstacles as we go there. Um, I'm going to pass it now to Liz Ranzel with the ACLU of Pennsylvania, um, who's going to talk some more about how the PA uh, District Attorneys Association is able to be this this powerful and and wield this much force and influence in in Pennsylvania. Liz, are you there? Good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank both um, Chris and Celine for their very pointed and accurate um, assessment of some of the landscape. I am. Uh, going to sort of go through a quick slideshow, and I promise that some of it may seem a tad bit unrelated to the, the subject matter tonight, but I want to kind of pull back a little bit and offer 
some broader perspective. I serve as the um, legislative director for the ACLU of Pennsylvania, which means I'm sort of a fancy way of saying that I'm the lobbyist for the ACLU. So I spend quite a bit of time in Harrisburg um, and a lot of time on the train with Greg Rowe, who is the PDAA executive director. Um, and so, you know, some of this, for those of you who may want a bit more of a um, granular look at sort of how this, their, the PDAA's power sort of manifests within the legislature and within legislation, I just thought I'd um, sort of rewind or pull back our lens just a tad so that for those of you who may not be as familiar with sort of you know, what happens in the legislature, what some of these bills look like, I'm going to give you sort of a, a quick overview, but I do promise it's not it will come together if it seems like I've gone off off track. But Lily, are you able to do the screen share? Yeah, just give me one second. Sort of have an OCD moment of uh, slides. I know I should have included that in the introduction. PowerPoint extraordinaire. OK, you can scoot to the uh, to the first one. So. What I just wanted to start quickly, the, um, the ACLU for the past two legislative sessions um, has created a report called More Law, Less Justice that reviews um, the um, trends that we see in the legislature toward over-criminalization, the number of bills that are passed um, with almost always large bipartisan support. We've referred to the legislature as a bipartisan offense factory. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about creating, or if we're, for tonight's purposes, talking about the mass incarceration lobby, um, you know, the PDAA has lots of friends in that regard. Um, and that includes, you know, mass incarceration across the board begins with the legislature because you don't have any offenses, you know, you don't have criminal offenses without the legislature enacting them and the governor um, or passing them and the governor signing them. So, um, so some of this is being drawn from the next couple of slides are sort of drawn from what we do with this report. Oh, sorry, I think I made you click on the hyperlink there. <laughs> so um, one of the, th it's, it's important to note how much the Pennsylvania legislature has expanded the, our crimes code over the past several decades. Um, in 1972, the legislature um, created our modern crimes code, um, which only included 282 offenses, which include and sub offenses um, that pretty much covered all criminal behavior um, that you could kind of possibly imagine. It was very well organized. It didn't contain any sort of overlapping offenses, um, and so there's very you know there's a um, uh, those provided all the tools necessary, particularly that prosecutors say that they always want um, to give law enforcement the tools that they need um, to keep communities safe and to hold people accountable. Uh, but since that time, um, they've made, the legislature has made countless unnecessary changes and additions. Um, by 2010, the criminal code contained 636 offenses, and now there are more than 1,500 and growing um, each legislative session, um, which is over almost a 200% increase um, in the number of offenses just in that short, that short period of time. Do the next one, please. Thank you. Um, so one of the things and I, I put this slide here so that people have a sense of some of the levels of granularity of where we see um how, how legislation is built if you will as a sort of recipe for mass incarceration and so what we see routinely happening in the legislature is that there are bills that include new offenses um they which are often duplicative they um sort of cover the same course of conduct uh, but you'll often see these with like the named bills if it's a uh, you know sally's law or um you know Doug's law or something. So um, you'll typically see new offenses that really could also that what it is that they are trying to criminalize can already be covered under lots of different um, existing offenses. Uh, they like to increase the grading. So there's um, we refer to it sort of inside baseball um, the sort of felony fetish that legislators have. Um, they love to increase a penalty from a misdemeanor to a felony, um, and that happens 
all the time, which of course increases um, the, the um, period of incarceration and the, um, and the fines associated with different offenses. Uh, sentencing enhancements are also typically included and buried within legislation um, sent over to the Sentencing Commission, which is a whole other ball of wax, but um, to uh, make their own uh, decisions about how to enhance, um, to include sentencing enhancements. And then there's mandatory penalties. We're all familiar with mandatory minimums, uh, but I think um, it's important to note that there are other mandatory schemes, including um, repeat offense provisions, sort of like a street uh, three strike law, um, or requirements, mandatory um, requirements that sentences be served consecutively, sort of back to back as opposed to concurrently or at the same time. Next one, please. Uh, and this was just an example from last session's report. Um, how many bills, when we say carceral bills, these are the number of bills that were filed both by Republicans and Democrats that would have um, put people, um, it would have incarcerated more people and or kept them incarcerated for longer. 14 of those bills were enacted. And of those 14 bills, those new laws that were added to the crimes code, it created 15 new offenses expanded 10 definitions, created 16 new penalties, um, all with 100% bipartisan support. Next slide, please. I just wanted to note that, you know, I, I did really like John Wetzel. Uh, he, he is the Secretary for Corrections in the Commonwealth. Uh, he certainly recognizes this trend and um, offered this particular statement um, at a House Appropriations budget hearing um, when he was getting a lot of questions about the, um, the amount of uh, money that corrections was costing the Commonwealth. And he's like, you all are creating, you know, they get angry with corrections for the size of the budget, but if they weren't passing so many damn bills and keeping <laughs> and increasing, uh, you know, penalties and um, creating new offenses, uh, you know, some of those problems, certainly in terms of the budget, would be le far less affected. Um, okay, next one. So I mentioned this also because this problem of over-incarceration has very specific ripple effects throughout the, our system. Certainly, um, once uh, legislators, um, you know, they are the ones who decide what behavior gets criminalized to begin with. Um, they then embark on expanding the crimes code, which then expands the discretionary power of police and prosecutors. Um, so certainly, you know, the more offenses that there are on the books, the more, uh, the more options police have to enforce those laws, often selectively uh, against black and brown communities. Um, it increases by, you know, a huge measure the, the power of prosecutors. Um, they are the ones who get to decide uh, who to charge and what to charge people with. Um, and adding more offenses allows prosecutors to, to stack different charges. So often, you know, you'll hear, of course, on um, reports saying that someone's facing 200 years, you know, in prison for a particular offense. Well, that's because they've been able to stack numerous charges for the same, for the same action, for the same conduct, um, and use that as an opportunity then to coerce, arm twist, offer people um, plea deals that diminishes people's Sixth Amendment right to a trial um, and results in 96% of all cases in Pennsylvania getting um, resolved through plea deals. Um, so, you know, anyone who watches Law and Order should know that certainly there's no, uh, uh, the fact that there's trials at all is kind of laughable. Okay, so next, next slide. So drilling down a little bit, just in general, um, the broad power of district attorneys, the kinds of things that they, the, and most of this is unreviewable power that they enjoy within our criminal legal system. Um, I'm not gonna sort of go through these one by one, but I think um, you know, it's important to note all of the decisions that they, um, that they have the power to make. And the reason I'm saying all of these things is that a lot of where it's this power or the, the types of provisions that you see in legislation. These are all the ways that DAs and the PDA in particular sort of gets into the nooks and crannies of legislation in order to uh, make changes, pass new bills, et cetera. So, um, you know, anything that would have to do with, you know, mandatory minimums, 
um, you know, assist with their ability to influence sentencing. Um, the sheer number of offenses that are created by the legislature get, gives them the ability to charge more, to stack those charges, um, gives them greater power to negotiate plea deals, um, and, and certainly provisions around bail and pretrial detention also um, is affected by legislation, but most importantly, and why we're here tonight, of course, is the, the power to influence policy. So next one. And some of this was covered a little bit already, but I just wanted to, um, to offer this is by the, the DA's Association website. These are their four main, um, the bullet points of their mission. Um, this is all their language directly. Uh, and I think it is important to note that they do serve as sort of a trade association. So they do trainings, you know, they have a huge complement, I say a large, probably a large complement of their staff that's really, um, uh, that their role is to provide resources, training, information, um, for their members. And so many of them are not involved in the legislative work, um, but they do have a, obviously a gigantic uh, presence within the legislature. So that's their mission, but the, I focus there on the advocacy piece. And the next one, please. This is just a quick view of their organizational structure as it relates to, this does not include the rest of their staff, but. Um, there are, as has been noted, 66 DAs that are in the DA's association. That is not including um, the Philadelphia DA, Larry Krasner. Uh, there are 12 executive committee members. Um, they are all district attorneys from, um, from various counties. Uh, the executive director is sort of, you know, sort of huddled there in, in the middle. Uh, and then the, they have three uh, standing committees, three select committees, and three ad hoc committees that are all chaired and populated by DAs from across the Commonwealth. So the next one, I just wanted to, this is where I'll spend just a, a little bit more time. Um, we've had some really great analysis, both from Chris and Salim, looking at the power of the DAs Association. Um, some of this may be redundant, which perhaps is uh, never a bad thing to, uh, to focus on some of where the DA's association is particularly influential. What, I, what I'll what i say is this is maybe a little inside baseball, but maybe that's why you're here tonight. Um, but you know the, the legislature, and I will say this in their defense, um, they are responsible for knowing and trying to get their arms around an incredibly, like in a huge, an insane number of issues that there's no possible way any human being could have the level of expertise that's needed to be able to weigh in intelligently really on every single kind of issue that they're expected to vote on. Um, and so to that end, legislators rely largely on, they rely on their staff, um, but their staff doesn't have, they can't have all of that information. And so they rely on organizations, input, professional um, stakeholders. Um, so they look for their information in a, you know, from a variety of sources. Um, so that is not surprising. That's why it's important that the ACLU is there since we're in their ear about things. But, um, but you know, the DA's association and DA's and, DAs and or the association are sort of viewed as, um, you know, a very important resource for legislators and their staff. Um, they will al almost always reach out to them first to go over, um, to have them review pieces of legislation um, they assist often with drafting uh, the actual language of bills. They construct amendments to bills. Um, very few things pass without their approval, but I, I will note, I mean, what I think is worrisome from our perspective uh, is that they are considered neutral in some sense. And by that, I mean, you know, there are DAs that are elected Democrats and Republicans, um, but they're considered sort of professional sort of stakeholders that the DAs are and not viewed as um, having a particular point of view, which we all know is not the case. Um, that doesn't mean that um, they, well, I will say that that's, it is worrisome that they are sort of seen as like a, um, that they're just going for basic legal analysis to the DAs association um, because they do have a particular point of view um, and it is not one that we share. Um, so, um, and all right, so then the scope of influence, um, you know, there are a huge number of, so there's two ways that I was sort of thinking about 
describing this like um, their scope of influence. First is the um, can you hear me? Hold on. You got me back? Okay. I think it, my uh, other Bluetooth picked up my, my voice. But um, so with the scope of influence, the two things that I would mention here is first the range of issues that they get involved in. Um, there's largely a um, uh, they stay in their lane sometimes, but they get invited to pretty much review anything that really doesn't have anything to do with their role as a prosecutor. Um, so right now we're dealing with a probation bill, Senate Bill 913, for those who might care, that which may be running next week in the Senate. Um, and, you know, they've offered, they've inserted language in there that has practically, I mean, it has gutted it has not just watered the bill down, but risks making probation worse in Pennsylvania. Um, and so I don't know why they're involved, though, in talking about probation, but they wanted to get in some opportunities to make it easier for judges to incarcerate people after um, probation has been revoked. Um, and so they have a they're in their lane. Um, they're outside their lane sometimes. Um, and they also are involved at sort of every step of the process, whether that's coming up with an idea, whether it's drafting new legislation, whether it's amending existing legislation or introducing their own. Um, and then the final one is really the political fear. And I think this has been, we've touched on this a couple of times, but I think what I do want to underscore is that, you know, it, the DAs themselves are not the generator. Um. Uh, sorry about that. So, um, but, but the DA's association does not create this problem. They are the benefactors of a huge cultural sort of presumption of, around punitive, um, a, a culture that is punitively, uh, presumptively punitive, I should say. Um, and so, and by that, I mean, we are really, what we're battling against is not just the DA's association, but it's the the Willie Horton fear, the fear that if a legislator like has a bad vote or supports something that maybe that seems risky, um, that they're going to get blamed for it. Um, and so there's a huge, you know, the safest bet for most legislators is to just side with the DAs. And so, um, you know, I do want to, I, I mentioned that because some of us, I think it's really important for, for those, uh, we as members of the public, as voters, um, as people involved in this movement to call and make sure, particularly to our legislators, um, that they know uh, that we recognize when they take difficult votes. There are a lot of legislators that are like, what am I going to, how do I vote against this? People are going to say, I hate babies. You know, I don't care about, um, you know, child victims of rape or something. I mean, and so some of this stuff is, it's hard for them to vote no. And so we have to do our part um, and so maybe we can go to the, the next slide, which is really just trying to look at how we, oh, sorry, this is my greatest fails. Um, oh, you know, let's skip to the next one. I might go back to this. So really unwinding the power of the, the DA's association and challenging it, diluting it. Um, you know, I will say that it's not going to be possible to eliminate the DA's association. There will be, as long as there's going to be prosecutors, there will be um, people who are interested in listening to them. Um, and so really our best hope is to dilute some of that power, um, obviously electing better DAs, um, treating DAs like the elected officials that they are, which means giving them a call, asking them what their position is on pending legislation or get, letting them know about pending legislation and asking them for their, their perspective um, uh, or asking them to support or oppose a particular bill. Um, the third would be offering legislators different perspectives. And by that, I mean, um, you know, if they only have one input, if there's only one expert in their ear, like DAs um, or other prosecutors offering them an analysis of a bill, you know, we've been working with public defenders to make sure that they are, um, that they are being asked for their input um, and hearing from family members, from directly impacted people, um, so the more information that they have, the more like opportunity we have to sort of dilute the singular message of the DA's association. And then finally, the 
um, you know, tackling the PDAA sort of head on. And so this is like probably extra granular, but, you know, some of this is really about trying to get them to remain neutral on particular pieces of legislation, um, trying to target specific DAs that are in the in leadership on the executive committee, trying to peel some of them off um, from different positions. I mean, I will, one of the things I forgot to mention is that, you know, the, the, um, the legislator, the DA's association sort of has a kind of Wizard of Oz moment, I think, how, like power behind it, which is to say that, that, you know, I think most legislators assume if the, the PDAA's position on something is X, um, then that is somehow like every single one of the DAs in the association automatically agrees with it. I'm sure that that is not always the case. It may be more true than not, but I don't think they poll every single member before they take a position. Um, and so that by, so I just think it's important for us to think about a little bit how, um, you know, the, the those DAs, um, if we can peel them off of one another, have a few take, you know, one or two take a different position, say on mandatories and kind of defect from the official position, then we can start sort of cracking that that facade of um, you know uniformity and unanimity uh, within the DAs, um, and so we can go back to the last one, and people can sort of mull over. It was just I wanted to highlight. We have this on our website called uh, knowyourdaandpa.org, but the um, uh, which is there, and that we have a. You go back to Lily, just to the the greatest fails, or just some highlights of lowlights, I should say of. Um, really egregious, bad um, you know, moments in the DA's history that sort of date back to 2010, 2011, 2015, sort of recently, but um, really looking at how they've supported mandatory minimums, tried to get those reinstated, um, saying that there are no innocent people in prison in Pennsylvania as a way to um, try to prevent people who have been wrongfully convicted and incarcerated from receiving compensation totally torpedoed our civil asset forfeiture reform bill, saying that it was a drug dealer's bill of rights. Um, one of the most appalling was when they opposed legislation to grant immunity to child sex trafficking survivors because they believed that if the victims were in the criminal legal, if they were in the system, that they would actually be safer somehow, which was just an astonishing, I think that was in 2016, sort of jaw-dropping moment. Um, so in any case, so, Certainly visit, invite you all to visit our website, it has a little more information on this and i um, happy to answer questions afterwards. Sorry, I ate up so much time. <laughs> Liz, thank you. We're so lucky to have you here really drawing back the curtain on, on this particular Wizard of Oz. I really feel, um, yeah, like I really feel like there's so much to take away from what you were talking about, especially around the extent of power that the DA's association has in Pennsylvania. And I think that it's like, yeah, I just, I'm really glad for, for all of these people, us being able to learn about this together and really understand, uh, more of what's happening about behind the scenes so that we can actually get in there and start addressing it since these are the conditions that we are in, um, and on that note, I'm going to next pass it to um, Shamita Pitt, who's a leader with Free Them to Heal Us out of Philadelphia. Um, we've talked a lot about tonight about the influence that the DA's Association has and the ways that they're using it to keep people incarcerated. Um, and one of the bills that's coming up that, that Salim talked briefly about in his part um, is um, Senate Bill 835, a geriatric parole bill, which we can put some more information about in the chat. Um, and so Shamita is going to talk to us about uh, what that bill would mean for, for our communities um, in Pennsylvania and why it's so important that we find ways to tackle the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association so that they can't stop this bill, right? The way that, as Liz pointed out, they've like failed our communities in so many ways. Um, and so it's so important that we figure out uh, how to really go after them so that they can't get in the way in this bill. So Shamita is going to talk to us about the importance of, of that work. Shamita, I'm going to unmute you now. Hello, everybody. Yes, we got you. To be here and speak on behalf of my family, my community, my father, who's incarcerated um, at Dallas, well, he was incarcerated at Dallas and they moved him to SCI Benner 
So he's been incarcerated now for 32 years. Um, I'm My name again is Shamita Pitts and I'm a member of the Amistad Law Project helping out. Um, and my family also is usually here. Um, so I'm speaking on everybody's behalf tonight. Um, my father uh, is, is a good person and he's a good father. He's a good grandfather, but unfortunately he's behind bars. So it would be a great benefit for not only my family, but the community at large. He was a community man. My father worked for the city of Philadelphia as a lifeguard. He worked uh, at the uh, longshoremen. Um, and he was there for, I would say, 15, 20 years before he was incarcerated. So now he gets a pension from his job that he had, um, which helps him. But my father has a lot of elements uh, health elements and a lot of these prisoners uh, now in the ge ge uh, geriatric um, population are ill and they're being housed in the main population and cannot be treated for their elements. Um, my father has been hospitalized many of times for uh, minor things that could have been taken care of if it wasn't delayed. Um, and I think that our taxpaying dollars are being spent in the wrong places. Um, you know, if our family could be home and we could take care of them, it would be better for the taxpayers because more and more um, of the population are getting older. And we're going to have more and more uh, facilities built instead of that money being spilt on um, being spent uh, for schools, um, for programs to keep our young people out of these facilities. My father would be a big benefit to the community to help our youth. Uh, he's a grandfather. He's a great grandfather. He's a husband. He's a father of five children. And all of us are here um, just still grieving his loss um, because he was a, a big input to our family. Um, I want to say that um, the Amistad Project has given us some hope um, because I feel like uh, we can all put our heads together and we can all put our, um, you know, our resources and, and thoughts together to make this happen for all of the prisoners um, who've been incarcerated for more than 20 and 25 years. I feel as though they did their time. And this bill would, would make it so it would be possible for them just to come home and, and live uh, uh, the rest of their life helping others. They have skills that they have learned in prison. Um, my brother was incarcerated with my father for 20 years because he didn't have my father at home. My younger brother was incarcerated for five years before he was released for marijuana charges. So uh, systemic racism does play a part, I know, but um, you know, we can make a difference out here for our men were home and they, they really do have a great impact on the families and the communities. So I just believe that this bill would heal us. And if we freed them, it will heal everyone in our community and our families and our state. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shamita. Really grounding us in and why this is important, right? Like why we're spending all this time learning about uh, this institution, why we're spending so much time learning it so that we can bring people like your your father home. Um, so thank you so much for, for sharing that with, with everyone here. Um, all right, now I'm gonna pass it to Chris, who's gonna tell us now that everyone's like raring at the bit, like how do we get this BDAA? How do we bring folks home? Uh, Chris is gonna let us know. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Shamira. Uh, thank you, Liz and Salim. 
um, and everybody who's spoken so far for breaking down the issue so clearly uh, and shedding light on how the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association has played such an integral role in propping up mass incarceration. Uh, the fantasy writer Ursula Le Guin once said, we live in capitalism, its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. I think we could swap out mass incarceration for capitalism in that quote. Um, mass incarceration and white supremacy's power seems inescapable, but we can resist it. Now the DA's association isn't magical. They're just a collection of people. Like all of us, they can be moved by other people around them and in their lives. None of us is an island. Just like the DA's association unites over 60 powerful individuals, when many of us get united, we can be powerful. So first, we must make that power that keeps the system in place and that's currently invisible. We have to make that power visible to people. We have to draw back the curtain. Uh, we've done a bit of that tonight, but what are our next steps to limit the mass incarceration lobby in Pennsylvania? Well, we're gonna launch a campaign to get the PDAA to support geriatric parole and SB 835. That's the bill that would allow people over 55 or people with a chronic and serious health condition to apply for parole. So I don't know if you know that, if you know, but there are over 8,000 people in Pennsylvania right now who are sentenced to life without parole sentences and virtual life sentences that guarantee they're gonna die in prison. That doesn't even count the number of people who are in on long sentences of 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, who will succumb to old age or illness and die in prison. Uh, people are dying in prison alone without so much as being able to be comforted by their families. Some of us have had to experience that in the early part of the pandemic when we had to say goodbye to loved ones over Zoom because we weren't allowed in hospitals or in nursing homes. Uh, but incarcerated people's families have had to endure this reality for decades and they don't get access to Zoom to say goodbye. At best, they might get a phone call. We urgently need a pathway home for aging people in prison and the possibility of a second chance. And that's why we're foregrounding this demand with the DA's association. As you know, Liz was talking about all the terrible things um, that the DA's association has done, um, but that's specifically why we're focusing on this issue. Uh, the first thing we're going to ask people to do is to sign a petition supporting this demand. We'll be dropping a link in the chat right now and also following up with people afterwards on email. So it would be great if you could share this petition with your friends and family and on social media so that other people can sign it. Uh, the second thing we're going to do is to organize people by county to get them in groups and ask their district attorney to publicly support geriatric parole by signing on to a letter that explicitly says they'll support SB 835, the geriatric parole bill. So we're gonna get people together in groups early next year and reach out to DAs by email and then meet with them if that's possible. If we can win them over, that's great. And that can help us build momentum to make sure the DAs Association doesn't oppose our efforts to address the humanitarian crisis of thousands of people in Pennsylvania prison dying of old age and disease. So if DAs in different areas don't support us, we're gonna organize in those communities. There are tons of people that might be able to get a county DA to have a change of heart. Community members, faith leaders, elected officials, labor, labor leaders, and so on. So we're gonna reach out to these people to see if they can unite with us in asking DAs to have a heart and support geriatric parole. So I need people to do two things. First, sign a petition. And second, if you're interested in being a part of this campaign to get DAs to do the right thing, click on the link in the chat and fill out the form. Um, we're also gonna follow up with everyone on email because uh, we wanna make sure as many people who wanna be a part of this effort can actually be a part of it. Uh, when we move out together, anything is possible. Together, we can care for each other and together we can be powerful. The saying I'm fond of is, uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Uh, I hope we can go far together. So please remember to sign up on the sign-in form um, and the sign petition. 
Uh, we'll be following up with all of you early in the new year. Uh, and with that, I want to kick it to Angie to help close us out. Good evening, good evening, good evening to all. Wow, this has been truly a powerful event thus far. My name is Angela Baker, and I am a member of Free Them to Heal Us, and also a member of CABI. This has been an informative event tonight. If you would agree with me, show me by a thumbs up. Use your reaction button, put it in the chat. Awesome, awesome. I see it, I see it. One thing I know for sure is that if we don't have the information about how this system is keeping our loved ones locked up, we cannot properly fight it. So I am so grateful to all the speakers tonight who has broken things down for us to, to a simpler form. And so thank you again, speakers, you did an excellent job. And as I close us out for the night, I want to ground us in the possibilities and ground us in the realities of holding the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association accountable. All right, we got to hold them accountable. If we cannot get them to support geriatric parole and get the legislators to pass, it, it will cause so much harm to many of our loved ones so that they cannot come home. Um, so we got to get on board. I am going to talk uh, a little bit about why this is so important to me, why I am here. The truth of the matter is this, I have been fighting, and I mean, I have been fighting for many years, over 38 to be exact, to bring in my loved one home, Eric Joseph, or Rick, as many of y'all have called him. He is incarcerated at SEI Chester, and is serving a life sentence without, listen, here we hear what I said, without the possibility of parole. In other words, as we call it by its true name, death by incarceration. Rick has been fighting to get his case overturned and I have been steadfast and unmovable by his side to help him come home through the courts. But we, uh, uh, but we are trying every door that is possible, any door that is opening, and we cannot leave anything on the table. We need Rick home with us. And he has been incarcerated again since 1984. And he is 56 years of age. And we need to open up as many avenues as possible for him to come home. That is why I am fighting. That is why I am here. That is why it is so important for me to get this geriatric bill passed and to stop these district attorneys from opposing it. This bill would make Rick immediately parole eligible. Now, I know that not everyone will have a personal story, but I would just love I would just love it if anyone and everyone could write in the chat as why this is, or why they are interested in making sure uh, the Pennsylvania District Attorney Association support geriatric bill. Once you write your comment in the chat, I will read some of them out loud, okay? So go ahead, go ahead while the chat is open. Put in some of your thoughts, put in some of your whys, and then I will try to read a few of them, and I'm going to just pause just for a moment while I glance through them, okay? Okay, let's see what we have in the chat. Okay. Um, 
Joan says the the bill will be both for medical parole for people with serious alignment and also geriatric parole, which will okay will apply to everyone. Yes, that is what the bill is. Okay. Let's see if anybody else made a comment. Um Asides my why, this is Amy, asides my why, uh, we have to ask why those who are who aged out of crime are being held beyond redemption. That's a good one, Amy, good job. Uh, John says, I don't know uh, that we have talked enough about the economic economics loss of money saved. Faith says, my son Christopher, who is a lifer, and every one human and every other human being serving a life sentence. Uh, Sean says, Sean says, uh, I'm fighting for this bill because it will help people like my friend uh, um, Dawu and many others deserve it individuals uh, who could benefit um, and our communities. And uh, Ms. Didi says, because they are deserving <laughs> of being home with their loved ones. And the last one I see here is from Martha, Margaret, who says, development continues throughout life. People involved, humans deserve dignity in old age. These are some great comments. Thank you for posting. And I wanna say again, wow, it was so powerful to read these whys. You all are in this fight together with us. Allow me to say thank you for taking uh, time uh, to share that with us in the group. It's so important that we stay connected and communicate with one another and that your thoughts are of value to us. And we are all stronger when we pull together and it is inspires, it inspires not only me, but others to see why people are committed to this fight. I also want to thank and um, thank everyone again who spoke or who helped organize this event tonight. It takes a lot of work to pull this together. So thank you, Lil, for all your technical support. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, Gandhi, and thank you, um, Chris, and thank you, Salim, and thank you, Liz, and anybody, everybody who had any partaking of this event tonight. Y'all kudos, I did a great job. I pat myself on the back as well, because it takes all of us to get this fight off the ground. And so with that, I want to wish all of you a good night. This was very speedy and immediate. A meeting. <laughs> We've been moving right along. And I also want you all to be blessed and stay positive, stay encouraged, stay motivated, stay built up. Whenever you get down, reach out to one of us so that we can encourage each other because it, it sometimes becomes very frustrating when you hear a lot of no's. But today we're hearing some yeses because we showed up to say yes to power. Yes, to our privileges. Yes, that we can make a difference, even in times like these. And so, okay, all right, what else I have on my agenda? I pretty much said everything that I needed to say. And so I'm gonna ask in our techno, our tech team, our all in all, all around, uh, her wizard of the digital world, Lil, will she unmute everybody so we can celebrate and so we can salute and so that we can do what we do best and say, woohoo, we did it. And here we go again. And I want to say good night to all. Thank you so much. Woo! Good night. Woo! Good night, good night, good night everybody. everybody. Good night. Thank y'all, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I love y'all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Beyond the battlefield.